everybody. Welcome to Woodworking Wisdom. My name's Colin Way, and today is a really, really special uh, demonstration. It is the first time that we're doing a uh, demo for you with a live audience. <laughs> With a live audience in the new Axminster store in Axminster. Um, so I've already explained to you several times before that I really enjoy the jeopardy of going live. Well, there's no doubt that it's live here because I've actually got people stood in front of us or sat in front of us. And we will, we've asked them already, we will spin the camera at the end just to prove that there are people here. The project we're going to do today is a lidded bowl. Um, and that's straight out of um, Mark Baker's, let me get it off camera a minute, Mark Baker's um, Weekend Wood Turning Project book. I can't see a screen today, so I'm going to have to be directed as to where I am, this one here. And um, Steph on cameras will do all the, all the direction. We've got some questions or some live questions going to be coming from us, uh, hopefully from the people seated in front of me. Um, and Matt's got the microphone and he's going to be running around getting those questions. Same thing as usual, though, everybody. If you have a question, just put it in the chat and we'll do our best to answer it. Okay. So a little bit of background from the guys that are sat in front of us. They are a group um, of turners from Cornwall. We've checked their passports. They're all allowed to be here. Crossed the border almost into the, the um, following county. So they come through um, uh, Cornwall into um, Devon, uh, almost into Dorset, but... Uh, they stopped just in time. Uh, which club in Cornwall are you in? Bodmin. Bodmin, up on the moor. Excellent. Okay. Well, let's get started. So I've got two pieces of timber. Um, in Mark Baker's book, he does it from three pieces. Uh, sorry, from one piece, um, but cuts it into two pieces. We're going to do um, the bowl as a regular bowl. And it's a beaded bowl. Um, so I'm going to use the, um, the, the easy wood uh, beading cutters and then once we've done the bowl we're going to put a little lid on it with another piece of oak so we're going to keep it fairly simple but if you're keen to get the book um, then have a look there's about 24 26 different projects in that book um, a really really good read and um, for people that are trying to do a different project every single week um, it's a really uh, nice thing a reference book to be able to follow as well so look, here we go it's a, a little bit of oak I think there's a little bit of moisture left in this it's not sold as wet but I think it may be air dried so not as not as dry as a, a kiln dried board would be but um, I prefer it that way I want a little bit of moisture we will talk in a minute about uh, movement as we turn this bowl because every bowl regardless of um, its state will move a little bit and that's tension can spring um, this being a, with a little bit of moisture it might move a little bit more but looking at the way this is cut the, the actual grain is running this way this is going to be probably more stable than other um, other blanks the best thing to do what I would normally do is rough turn this even though it's sold as partly seasoned or air dried rough turn it just leave it a month or so are you going to take the mic over oh are you going to take the mic over okay we got some questions coming through yes go for it <laughs> <laughs> the audience just had to point out to Colwyn that I had my arm up for quite a while. He wasn't like, paying attention. Oh, I am sorry. Because um, okay. I'm looking on this mic, on this camera now, not the one that's normally next to you. I know, I'm sorry. Um, so we've got a question from Big Woody Al Green. Um, what's the lathe you're using today, Colwyn? <laughs> the, the, um, the lathe I'm using today is the 508. It's the Axminster 508. Um, the biggest machine that we do, um, to be honest with you. And this one will... You can quite easily turn from uh, center height to floor. It's a proper big bowl turning machine. Um, so a little bit overkill for what we're doing. But we need a big machine in here because we're not just demonstrating small projects like this. We can uh, very often be demonstrating things like bowl coring, for instance, long hole um, uh, vessel uh, making, that sort of thing. So long hole boring, anything like that. Yes. Good. And Martin Crosswell's been on. He has been making busy making snowmen today. Is it too early to mention the C word? Not at all. Not at all. It's August. Well, no, it's July. Um, that was his words, audience, not mine. So here's the thing. I do a little bit of work for Wood Turning Magazine and write articles for them. It's a thing that you write your Christmas articles in August because that's the deadline. You think about makers, which all of these guys are, all of you guys there. If you're making things to sell in shops, shops start buying in September. You need to start making now to get your stocks up ready for September 
for the shelves. It's really nice. And then around about March, Christmas ends, you have a few months off and you can start thinking about Christmas again. Yeah, that's the way it works. So I've just had another one come in. Um, let me find it. Big Cole on tour is asking, is it easier to turn on a larger lathe? He is a newbie. Not really. Depends on the project, really, your ability, all those things. The lathe, for me, the lathe doesn't make much of a difference. There's obvious, the obvious thing is stability. So if you're trying to do a big piece like this on a tiny little lathe, yeah, there's going to be issues there with stability and, and moving around, that sort of stuff. But the act of turning should not differ. So uh, bevel rubbing, where you place the handle, flute direction, all those sorts of things will not change from one lathe to another. It's the strength, the stability, um, and your ability that changes um, the, how easy uh, things are on the machine. Sorry, one more question, and then I'll let you get going. Um, so Terry's been on. It's asking, is the entropy resin mixed two to one? Oh, my goodness. I better send that question in as a question um, on email, because um, off the top of my head, I don't know. I've only played with it a little bit. Um, I'll have a I'm look on the sure. website. I think it is two to one. Now you mention it, I'm positive it's two to one. But just do it as an email, and we'll come back to you. Uh, tomorrow, I'll come back straight tomorrow. I'm going to start turning now. Don't let that stop you guys from asking questions, though. Just keep them coming in. Um, we've got an hour, so we've got a nice long time. Uh, we're going to start by roughing down so that we've got our blank. I, I fairly, I've sent it up fairly well, but I just need to rough down to um, uh, an even thickness and get a foothold. Um, so I'm just going to do a draw cut with the bowl gouge. Just going to put some earplugs in. I find we talk about um, eye protection, we talk about lung protection and things like that a lot, but we don't often on the lathe talk about hearing protection. And I'm starting to suffer a little bit more than I used to now from tinnitus and buzzing and things like that. Um, so I'm probably too late but i'm taking a few more precautions and you you have to think about especially bowl turning the bowl all that noise is being focused in your direction because you, you're basically making a big funnel so just roughing away some of this excess i'm going to create the foot in a moment let's just get us down to a nice round first though At this stage, I'm not worried at all about what sort of finish I've got. Right, I'll deal with that little end bit in a moment. The reason I say that is if I just carry on turning now, I'm going to break out through that, uh, through that section and we'll end up with lots of splinters and things like that. So I'm going to use a set of jaw jaws called H jaws. And basically, they're just a set of grippers. OK, so there we are. Set of gripper jaws. They've got serrations on the inside. So I'm just going to measure from the inner edge, so the inner part of the jaw to center. Do a little mark. There's gonna, that's going to be my whole point. We'll reverse the bowl over when we finish, just to get rid of that whole point. No one saw that deliberate mistake, did they? Everyone. Just wanted to know um, what speed you're running the lever. This, at the moment, it's only running at a thousand revs, but I am going to turn it up now. I'm going to turn it up now. We've got it almost round. In fact, let it just like, take that little bit of edge away there. So I'm just going to come back from that side. There we go. Um, let's just refer back to, to Mark's bowl that he made. So remember, everybody in the audience can see that's the one he made. That, I don't know whether you can see that stuff, just for everybody watching online. That's the one he made. Now, that's a different dimension piece of timber, but I'm still going to make it similar um, in shape to that one. So we're going to start with a fairly um, deep foot. And a sort of OG, it's quite a bulbous OG. 
So we can start now thinking about that shape. So I'm coming around first, go a bit deeper with that foot. Coming around first with a rough convex. before coming into that little concave. So roughing it out. So that's roughed out. If we now change our presentation of the bowl gouge. So roughing out, I'm calling a pull cut. So that would be where I drag the bottom surface of that gouge around and swing in. To the little concave. Now I want to get a clean finish. I'm going to bring the handle of the gouge all the way over here. We're going to turn the lay speed up, rub the bevel, and now I'm going to push from my right hand up the length of the tool. That allows the gouge to slide. As it slides, I'm bringing the handle around to match the curve. And then push away again to create the concave. <laughs> Swallow half the timber whilst I'm doing it. Um, where we where we got the, the bevel rubbing into this corner, you can't quite get the bevel right up into the corner. It's a right angle in here. So there's a little area of around about 10 mil, about 3 eighths that's not actually being touched. So I'm going to come just at the end with a little skew. There we are, just to tidy up. And I want to make sure the curve is, is constant as well, so it's coming around. Now, the next thing, we are I will do one finishing cut on there in a second, but let's just tidy up this the underside of the base. It will be shaped completely differently by the time we finish. Now I'm going to just put a little center point on, because to reverse this in a moment, we're going to use a push plate, and I want to push against it with the tail stop. Um, so I need to know centre. Things change when you hollowed out a lay, or hollowed out a bowl. So centre is important to know at this stage. So one more finishing skim. There we are. I'm just looking, having a quick glance at, at Mark's design because I'm going to try and keep true to it as much as possible. We're now going to use the Easywood, probably one of my favorite Easywood tools, to be quite honest with you. This one is the um, one of the beading cutters. Uh, really nice little, little cutters. Um, I used to use, for quite a while, I used to use um, a ring, uh, captive ring tool, so the first part of the captive ring tool. The trouble is with those is they don't have a pointed um, corner uh, like these do. These are specifically made for beading. Yes, uh, Steph, question. Um, firstly, I'm getting a bit of a crackle on the headphones on your audio line here, so I think it's pulling on the cable a little bit. All right. Firstly, but whilst you're sorting that out, um, I've got a question here from Cliff. He's asked, in your opinion, are the Ellsworth signature gouges worth getting for bowl making? Uh, yes, they are. Um, if you if you want a pattern to follow or if you struggle with your sharpening, yes, they are. And the reason I say that is because you can put an Ellsworth grind on a normal half-inch gouge if you know what you're trying to get to. If you don't, then you need a pattern. And that pattern helps you then set your grinder up to get that every single time. So if you don't, yeah, go for the, 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 the ready ground one. Record your sharpening when you do so you can get back to it every single time. Um, if you own something like a Tormek, Tormek gives you an Ellsworth grind formula as well so you can do your own. Just bear in mind that if you're using a Tormek and you're re-grinding a gouge from new, it might take you a little bit longer. Um, so you might want to uh, go to a bench grinder just to get the shape there and then do your sharpening on your Tormek, for instance. Perfect. And I've got a question from Frederick. Um, what are the advantages of the 508 over the 406? 
Um, you know that it's got a larger motor, but is there anything else? No, size, capacity is the only thing. Only thing. Once you've done that first cut with the, um, the scraper, that allows the, the cutter to sink into the first groove so you can keep them equal. And it sinks in a lot quicker as well. The timbers that are good for this would be things like this oak. They, they cut really well. Um, things not to use would be woolly timbers. So any of the soft ones won't be any good. Some of the soft, punky sycamores don't work really well because any areas with rot or decay in will tend to sort of chip out. So we're not going to sand today, guys. We've got quite a big project here. And I've allowed for a few questions. So we're not going to sand today, um, just to help with, help with timing. Um, but we are going to we'll do every other part of that project. Now, Mark's design has a slightly deeper curve here. So we're going to go into that now. I'm going to use a smaller bowl gouge, a little quarter inch. Quarter inch in English money, three eight in American. There we are. That's more toward. It's a squatter version. A squatter version of what Mark was trying to produce. Maybe the overhead on this one. Steph, if you could, that might show that a little bit easier. That way? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll sort this out, this little um, base, once we've um, finished the actual grip itself. We've got the inside to do. We've got to put a little bit, a little lid, which is going to sink in it. Um, but for sanding, because we've got bevel rubbing there, and that scraper's done a really, really good job on that, that, um, that oak. Um, it's not a huge amount. I'd probably start on a 150 rapidly on to a 240 and then on, onwards and upwards from there on. But, okay, so there's the, that's the idea of what we're going to be doing on the inside. That lid is sunken in, um, a nice little lip and a little beaded uh, shelf for that to sit on. Um, I've, I think I've spoken about it already, but this timber is not completely dry, so I want to allow for a little bit of shrinkage. We don't want a box fit because if we have a box fit, that airtight fit, it will get stuck fairly quickly. We want it to go on and come on and off easily. Um, so I think now we pre pretend that we've sanded. We'll take it off the screw chuck. Normally I like using the C jaws. Normally I just keep the C jaws in. But because that base is going to be um, so deep, I thought, well, they're perfect, those, um, those H jaws, the gripper jaws. So we'll take that one off. We'll pop the, the old SK100 on with the H jaws in. There we go. Now, just a little word of warning here. If you're doing something like this and you're making a, a small base, say, for instance, you've got a quarter inch or six mil deep base, you're using a set of dovetails. It's very easy to over tighten the dovetails. And actually, then when you get a big cut going or a catch on the inside, that foot will just break off. The grain on this bowl, though, the, the annual rings are going that way. So they're actually going down through, which is pretty unique, really, for something uh, of this size. Normally, they'll come this way, and that's a weak point there. So just be a little bit aware of that. Sometimes a gripper might be better than a set of dovetails if you've got a very small base. Just be aware, like any jaw, you will have to clean the base up afterwards. And the method that you use to do that is entirely up to you. I've got a couple methods with me here. I'm going to use them both. We've got a set of um, button jaws, but we've also got a, a got a set of push plates as well okay so we'll just explore both of those on this type of bowl i don't need to worry about going thin we've got no recesses there to worry about or anything like that so i'm just going to make a nice what we're going to put in this this is almost like um it's got to have a lid on it so we're going to have i don't know a rice dish or as an uncooked rice dish um or nuts or things like that
Um, and we're into, what well, I could say into regular bowl coring really, but instead of starting by hollowing out immediately, what I'll do is just clean up this outside edge because we're going to have, don't forget, a fairly wide rim. So I'm just going to get this down to where I want it to be. So a little convex rim. So bevel rubbing. Just pushing the handle away. I want to measure my blank. The blank that I've got is a much smaller blank than that of the bowl. So we're just going to measure what I've got here. So around about six inches. So yeah, we've got plenty there. So I think I'm going to stop where we stopped here. That's going to be where we put our first bead. All that, the bead, the shelf bead anyway. Yes, another question coming up here. Yeah, hollowing out from the center out or the outside in? We're going to go from the um, from the outside to center. And the reason okay. for that? Um, if, well, I try and come the other way, I don't have any bevel rubbing. And I can't control that nice smooth glide, you see. If we come the other way, generally you can do that if you're using a scraper. So if you're using an easy wood tool, for instance, you would come from center outwards. Um, I want to have a nice glide from the bevel so that it doesn't give me an undulating line. It gives me a nice, clean, smooth one. All right? You can get away with it on this. It's when you're hollowing end grain, it's more problematic. Do you know? So a little bit at a time now. And this is what we were talking about. Look, so from there down to center. You can run the other way. And what I mean by that is, is I can cut down into timber. But I'll always end up with finishing cut by cutting down towards centre. Now, whilst we still have a little bit of strength there, we're going to do this, this platform, this little bead. So we use the same tool. We use the little easy wood cutter. There we are. So we've got a nice little bead in there. Now, as long as I don't slip, or skid across the surface, that's perfect. And that is an issue, that is a problem. Now, the most, most of the reason that you get that skid, usually it's on the final couple of cuts, and it's on the final couple of cuts because your body tenses up without you realizing, because you know that you don't want it to skid. The best way to overcome it um, is to turn that flute from around about the two o'clock position, which I would normally cut at, all the way over to about three o'clock. Then present the tool, handle, um, handle up same level as the cutting edge that then presents that cutting edge dead upright so it has no chance to skid anywhere once you've done that you create the line that then in turn creates a little shoulder on the inside that the bevel will rest, sort of rest against once you've got that shoulder then you can twist the flute back to two o'clock and finish your push and it's just a little controlled um, final cut. <laughs> just like that one.
There we are. Let me just clean that up. Easy wood tools. Any of the scrapers like to be used with a handle in line with the cutting edge. That's different to most scrapers. Most scrapers like to be used like that with a handle high. Um, but it, it, they just seem to work um, more efficiently that way. So all I'm doing, as I come back, I'm running the bevel on the surface, then pushing forward, letting the, the cutting edge catch up. So we're just bullying that out, just, you don't need to. Take your time, everybody, to stay calm. But when you're sort of trying to do it to a certain time frame, just gonna push a little bit harder. I'm still feeling for thickness, trying to keep it fairly uniform. And those finishing cuts, I'm just taking my time, I'm calming down, just putting a steady, even um, pressure on there. But as I get to that last little bit in the middle, just slow down. What, what, you, what can happen, if you're pushing too hard at that point, you can tear the grain out and you'll have a little annoying area right at the very bottom, which just doesn't sand. So take your time on that area, just nice and gentle. It's just for oh, a little bit of a lump, a little bump in the bottom. So we've got to get rid of that. Stop and do another check. I always um, say it's, it's important to, to look with your hands first before you look with your eyes. Your hands will give a lot away, tell you when things aren't quite right. There we are. That will do us. Artful Bodger's been on today, Colwyn, saying he's learned something this week with the um, backing out for the next stroke when bevel, bevel rubbing. So taught him Good. something today. There we are. Good. My work here is done. Fantastic. Every day, literally every single day, I find I'm picking up new new bits of information from different turners, from even from beginners that have just started turning, different ways of doing things, easier ways of doing things. Everybody's got something to contribute when it comes to learning how to turn and and what's new and all those sorts of things. There we are, nice little bowl. We need to tidy this area up. So I'm just gonna, before we do the lid, I'm just gonna change these jaws over. We'll do that now. And we're gonna go with a set of wood plates. We have options, sorry, not wood plates, button jaws. We have options. We could go with a push plate where, we might use that in a minute, where I put that on the lathe, bring the tailstock up and push that against it to clean the, body, the bottom up. Um, we could use a set of wood plate jaws, which I'm a big, big fan of. But I thought, well, there's an opportunity. I don't use these often. And just had Nick Agar down, and we've done a little section on our favorite jaws. This was one of Nick's. So I thought, well, let's get this one out. We'll have a play with a set of buttons. So normal chuck, SK, well, I say normal chuck, SK114 on the back. Yes, Steph, you have a question. I do. I've got a question from Artful Bodger. Is a scraper a better choice to remove the gravy lump at the bottom of the bowl? I don't think so. I don't think so. Only keep the bevel rubbing. The, the reason that a gravy bump comes up is because your handle movement continues 
where there is a point in the bottom where a handle has to stop as you get to the, the, the bottom co uh, corner. Um, so it's just controlling that. The best thing to do there is get your bevel rubbing flat in the low spot just before that gravy bump and just push through it. And every now and then, do that two or three times, have another feel. If it's still there, do the same thing again until it disappears. Um, no, I, I mean, scrapers will give you a different finish. And I don't think that scrapers give you as good a finish as the cutting tools. And I call a bowl gouge a cutting tool. It's my, my preference. I need just to change our button positions. Let's come down one position. So a little Allen key. I tend to, if I'm doing this, just go, down, go around and loosen them all off first. Good point for questions if anybody has one. My singing days are over, so. Wow. Until the weekend, anyway. They should be over. <laughs> Uh, we was always taught to, when you're doing the bowl, to put a slight cut at the beginning where, where you want the bowl to finish, then you won't get the kickback. Like with a, a parting tool or something yeah. like that, yeah. I've, yeah, I found what the, the trouble is with that one, it does leave a, a little mark because the parting tool doesn't cut quite as well as the bowl gouge. So the, you then have to clean it up and then you're be left back in that same position. But if you're, when you're just starting out, absolutely invaluable to do that yeah your first bowl absolutely do that um and your second bowl and your third and your fourth until you're happy with the bowl gouge because a bowl gouge two tools that i constantly get asked questions or you see on social media problems with bowl gouge and skew chisels all of the time and bowl gouges um, and skews just need to be practiced so when you're a beginner that 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 learning to ride the bike bit, you know, where you're still trying to get your balance and things like that is still there. So it takes a while for that muscle memory to take over and for bowl gouges and skews to become an easy tool to use. Um, but yeah, no, that's a great way of preventing that skid. Uh, the, the other one, when I watch on, on YouTube, a lot of the turners, you just use a skew chisel all the time. Is that, you know, Ideal or what? For? For doing anything. Turning bowls, turn, doing... Well, I don't know about a bowl. I consider myself fairly good at skew work, um, but I couldn't turn a bowl with a, with a skew. I defy them to do that. I'd like to see it. <laughs> um, let's just get the tail style cut initially, just so I can reshape the outside of that foot. <laughs> what have I done wrong? No, that's it. I haven't centered the laid up. So there's me putting a center mark for the bowl in, which is really null and void unless I center the laid up first. Good. Right. Back to where we were. Just going to tidy up the outside of that foot. Lay speed to zero. Turn the laid on. Lay speed to zero because I've gone to... I've changed everything on the lathe. It's it's all it's all different. Um, I don't want any surprises. in a moment there's a little area right in the corner i just need to take care of and i'll do that with just the tip of the skew the only reason i'm using skew i'm using it like a um it's a negative rate scraper it's quite a good tool for getting into little bits of detail that'll do us good laid off before i take that tail stock away i want to make sure that everything's still nice safe and sound yes steph 
Yeah, I've got uh, Steve Way on here. Um, great asking, name, Steve. Steve, great surname as well. <laughs> um, asking, have you got your land legs back after your travels? Yes, we're all back. Reminiscing of Norwegian midnight sun and all that sort of stuff. And gentlemen, we'll turn here's a bit worried about the singing, to be honest. So <laughs> let's try not to. <laughs> well, I'm going to see uh, the gentleman will turn on Mark over the weekend, so he'll see my singing at first. Maybe that's why he's so worried. Yeah. <laughs> now we are... I've got to be a little bit careful here. I'm turning off a rubber foot. No, sorry, off a rubber jaw. Okay, that's contact area. You can't take big cuts here, so you've got to be a little bit careful. So I'm taking small cuts. We'll leave that. That's just because we can. Let's just pop a little mark in there. A little bit of, little bit of sanding, of course, you would just do to blend everything in. And that would be your the bowl part of your lidded bowl. Okay, so fairly straightforward. All we've thrown in there is the OG and the beading. Okay, and I've just made a slightly larger or longer foot to sort of replicate, well, not replicate, but to sort of do something similar to my good friend Mark Baker. Uh, oh, on my overhead, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Can't see the cameras. Are we good? <laughs> All right, everybody. So in the audience, We'll pass that round in a minute. I still need it, though, because i just got to size the lid. Um, we're going to go back with a screw chuck. Back with a screw chuck. And I mentioned um, right at the beginning of this stream that I quite like the jeopardy of live. Um, not only is it the jeopardy of live, but I've never turned one of these before. So um, normally we get a chance to turn one for uh, an image for you to see on YouTube. But yeah, I haven't done that this week. But it's just a bowl with a lid. Oh, wrong jaws. Just a bowl with a lid. If you can't turn a bowl with a lid for the first time, then I don't know who can, well. to be honest. We got another first next week. We're on scoops next week on live. While you're sorting out trucks, I've got a question from Artful Bodger again. Uh, he's asking, does the five does the five oh eight lathe have a swiveling headstock? Yes. If so, what is the advantage beyond preventing back pain? For um, if be honest with you, um, for me that is a huge advantage, especially so if you're a hobby turner then probably not it's not gonna make much difference because you'll be doing one or two bowls at a time but if you're into if you're a professional turner you'll be production turning you'll be doing lots of uh, rough turning you don't want to be suited over that lathe so having the ability to swivel the headstock is massive but then other th other jobs creep in so you think about tabletops think about wall sculptures all those things um you may just need that extra bit of of, of size to the lathe so is that that and the fact that you've got much bigger bearings, you've got a bigger motor. So if you want to do some bowl coring, for instance, you can do that quite easily on this this type of machine or any big machine. So those there's lots of things get thrown in um, to a bowl uh, to a, a lathe of this size. And he's just come back on again, saying that he's just noticed your posture um, and see that his, your elbow is the same level as the lathe's axis. Is that the best height for turning? The general rule for a a height of a lathe is to your elbow height, center height to elbow height. Um, I prefer to have mine a bit higher. So this, that's, that's a great height. I, you know, a little bit higher would be, be even better because you can stand upright for longer. Um, you're not stooping at all. And when it comes to doing hollow forms, I don't have a hollow form tool here, but a hollow form tool, they're fairly long pieces of kit and you want to have your hollow, uh, form tool underneath your arm. So then when you're doing that, you're having to crouch down to use it. 
So having a lathe higher or the ability to get it higher would be better for that sort of thing. This is the sort of lathe that you'd be doing that on, especially if you're doing big ones, you know. So, yeah, that's the reason uh, behind it. Just my Got another stats. question. Ooh, go for it. Hot off the press. Frederick's come on saying, are you not worried that being as the bowl is considerably thinner, is it going to move? That makes life a little difficult for the lid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. So normally what I would be wanting, sorry, normally what I would want to do would be rough turning and allow it to move and then return once it's finished its moving. Um, I don't want this, purposely don't want this as a tight fit anyway, so we can have a rally lid that's absolutely fine. This is just easy to take off, get whatever you want, and then back in again. Um, so, yeah, if I was trying to make boxes or, or, or you know, strong fitting lids, then yeah, absolutely. You would need to rough turn, make sure it's fully dry, seal it properly, all those sorts of things. But this is going to be just, this is going to be all right. This is going to be fine. I promise. Um, so this is going to be turned completely differently to what we would normally do. The lid or the knob of the lid is going to be here. The underside of the lid is here. And that's so I can take away the hold point, which is a hole as it's a screw chuck. So I'm going to, again going to make... Um, a foot here that the H jaws can grip. I've still got my um, dividers set for those jaws, so let's do a quick mark. Skim that surface. Let's just, just raise that tool rest a wee bit. Skim that surface. Now, before I turn that over, let's just skim the outside edge, true that up a little bit. Now that blank is ready to be mounted, mounted on those H jaws. Remember, this is a lid. I need to take that hole away, hence the reason we've done it like this. So, screw chuck now is finished with. a little bit more off of that. It would have been good, wouldn't it, if it fitted perfectly. <laughs> Three mil off of that. Not wasting much timber. So we'll just stop and check. I want to get this, this right first, and then I can start shaping that. That's it. That's there. Nice. Let's hollow out the underside. 
So we've got a, a fair amount to take away from here because I know I drilled in a good, good 15 mil, so a good 5 8. I'll sock out the way a little bit. There we are, bottom of the hole. Good. Right now I'm going to need to have a, a hole point. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. We're going to use another set of jaws. So I'm going to use a little C or set of C's, which hopefully we can expand into. Um, and you can decorate this, um, this recess that you're going to make. So let me very roughly set a size there. Let's go with small gouge. I'm going to get the, the skew in here again. So I'm going to go tiny skew, do a V or dovetail. That'll do. And sand that. What I am also going to do, I've just noticed, let's just take off this really sharp edge. Seat down nicely. And again, at that stage, you can sand. No, I'm not. I'm just going to do one more little bit of messing around. Because we can. All these little lines just take away, they, they take the highlight away from all the mistakes, you see. Yeah, right. That um, oak is turning beautifully, it's turning really, really well. So let's just do the interesting bit. Now we'll do the, the top of that lid. Frederick's been on. He's asked, um, now that we're up in shop, um, can you have your old workshop? <laughs> this is a limited time <laughs> only. We'll be back in the um, in the other workshops next week. There are a few changes coming to the other workshop. We're going to have a little bit of a spruce up, aren't we? A bit of a tidy up. Let's hope so. <laughs> Rip the right one. I've said it before, we stop 
in terms of the tightening or expansion, we stop just before we hear that first crack. It's a really important thing to do. And it's a certain pressure that you give the workpiece that you know when you go further, things are going to go wrong. But it's only something that happens when you've made the mistake several times, or it's only something you know about. Um, and I've made the mistake several times. Right, now we can take away some of that excess. There's a strong potential that this could be a um, a yarn bowl if I carry on going too far. It could be a hole in the top of this thing. So I just I ha actually haven't checked. I mean, um, feel free because I I need a yarn bowl. And so. you need some bloopers, don't you, for a blooper reel that you're doing? Well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think we'll stop there. That's good. I've got Ward uh, and Jim B um, asking when I'm coming back for my next training session. Um, well, I think Jason's offered to give you a training session a couple of times, isn't he? He's going to do your first box. I'm not sure he can handle it, to be honest. I think he... <laughs> I think I'd end up confusing him. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman Woodturn is voting that I do a hollow form. I'm not sure I'm quite there yet. Well, the only trouble is with hollow forms is they don't make the best demonstration because 50% of the demonstration is done inside where you can actually see what's going on. So it's not the best. Sorry, those people that demonstrate hollow form turning. Not very visual. Go to a little bit of a smaller gouge. I want to get right in there with that little knob. think then we need to have at least a little bit of decoration in the top and then obviously a sand but there A lovely bit of wood, that, actually. Doesn't really need a huge amount of sanding. We've got a little lid. It's going to sit in there nicely. I'll bring that over. Not, not massively similar to Mark's. Should we do the main camera there? Is that all right? Or up or overhead? Yeah, there you go. So that's my little homage and a thank you to Mark Baker, who was an amazing friend of mine. And um, started me off writing for Wood Tony Magazine, so I was really, really, really chuffed and thankful to him. So there we are. <laughs> Lovely. Well, have we got any more questions before we finish? When you said you'd uh, stop to allow the wood to settle, would you bring that indoors or just put it in the workshop? 
wherever you had room, really. If you bring it indoors and you've got central heating, that's going to cause problems because it'll dry too rapidly. Uh, workshop's a good one. The, the best place would be your wine cellar. Yeah. How many people have a wine cellar? Wine cellar. <laughs> but you know, the, the sort of brick building, somewhere there, the, the temperature doesn't change rapidly. You know, it's fairly constant. Not too much airflow, those sorts of things. So that's that's pretty good. Yeah. Fredericks asked, what uh, finish would you recommend on this project? Probably a go for a fin I, finishing oil for me all the time, especially with the oak as well. Finishing oil does work nicely, depending on what you're going to use it for, of course. But that, that for me, that works. What sort of speeds were you doing? And so, finally, what's it worth? Uh, <laughs> the speeds, we started off roughing down about 1,000 revs. I went up to about 1,600 to bulk of the, the rest of it. The, the lid could go a little bit quicker because it's a very small piece. Um, but yeah. And the, the thing is, we had a question at the beginning as to what lathe would be best, what, what's best, um, big or small. Um, the smaller you go, the speed will have to be less because of the balance and the weight of the timber compared to the weight of this, the lathe and so on. This beast can handle a project like that fairly easily, you know. Um, so we were able to keep the speeds up fairly, fairly well. Are we good? We're at 3.56. Right, let's get... To Let's let's get a, a shot of Bobman Wood Turners. There we are. I'm gonna clap Bobman Wood Turners for making it all the way up here as well. <laughs> there we are, they are real. Nice one. Thank you. Right. Well thank you ever so much, everybody. Thank you ever so much. Don't forget, remember every week I say it, if you like what you see, give us a thumbs up. Share us around with all your friends and, um, and um, subscribe to the channel, of course. Until next week, where we'll be doing wooden scoops. See you again. Bye-bye.